برنامه نانگالا سرخ نگاه میکنید مجله اجتماعی سیاسی که به زبانهای انگلیسی و فارسی روی کانال جدید پخش میشه سلام به همگی من مریم نمازی هم و من فریبرز پویا هستم در برنامه این هفته مصاحبه ای داریم با کینان ملک نویسنده در رابطه با بحران مهاجرت در اروپا در زم در رابطه با 8 مارس نظرات بعضی از نمایندگان مجلس اسلامی در رابطه با زنان و خود مجلس طرح قانون برای قدغن کردن نقاب در مصر در ملع عام و اعتراض اوریان علیه حجاب و در ضمن یه فتوای احمقانه علیه کارهای حمایتی از همجنسگرایان باید حتما این برنامه رو ببینید با ما باشید هفته گذشته روز جهانی زن بود میدونیم که در خیلی از جاها اعتراضات مختلفی صورت گرفت تظاهرات های زیادی بود و خب مسلما روزی بود نه به خاطر اینکه تمرکز بشه روی ستم علیه زنان که یه چیز هر روز است ولی یه روزی بود برای تمرکز روی مبارزه برای حقوق زنان و تاریخن هم ربط داره به این مبارزه در سال 1908 تحسن اعتصاب کارگران زن بود در نیویورک و چند سال بعد در یک جلسه بین المللی سوسیالیستا این روز رو به معنی روز جهانی اعلام کردن دقیقا و اهمیت فکر کنم روز جهانی زن و گرامی داشتش گرامی داشت اعتراض و مقامته و نشون دادن این و انکاس دادن این مقامت مهمه شما میبینیم مثلا توی سازمان های بینومنالی دولتی الان رست شده که روز جهانی زن رو در موردش یه کلمه میگم مثلا توی بازار بورس نیویورک اون زنگ شروع معادله و مبادله رو امسال زن ها بدن زدن یا خانم اردگان اردگان رئیس جمهور ترکیه گفته که بله دفاع کرده از حرم و داشتن حرم سلطان ها نقش خیلی خوبی داشته و در مورد مثلا آموزشی آزشی داشته, داشته. اینا رو میشید و تفاوت اینو با اون مقاومت رو میشید نشون داد که نکته اصلی گرامی داشته روز جهانی زن روز مقاومت شد ولی مسخره ترین چیز این بود که آیت الله خامنه ای روی توییتر به انگلیسی ایشون حرفای بی خود میزنن و یکی از این حرف های بی خودشون این بود که روز 8 مارس یک توییت دادن که گفتن که پایه فرهنگ قرب اینه که زن رو به عنوان کالا میبینه برای نفع سود مردان و به نفع مردان و خب مشخصا آخرین کسی که باید از زن و حقوقش حرف بزنه خود آقای خامنه ایه که قوانینش واقعا فر... ف... عمیقا یه فرهنگ ضد زن و اینکه زن رو به عنوان یه کالا دیدنه دقیقا و این <تصفيق> توییت ام... خا... ام... خامنی نشون داد که جوهر زدیت با زن ها از همین آغاز و رفقا و اطرافیانش دقیقا و خب در ادامه این میبینیم که در خب هفته پیش هم در رابطه انتخابات مجلس خیلی صحبت کردیم میدونم که بینندگانم خبر یکی از اعضای مجلس رو شنیدن نادر قاضی پور که فیلم برداری ازش شده که گفته جای در مجلس جای فکر کنم اولاق و زن نیست و واقعا نشون دهنده دیدگاه هم جمهوری اسلامی و خود این مجلس به زنانه دقیقا اگه تمام مجلس جمهوری اسلامی پر از اولاغ بود حداقل حداقل قوانین دفاع از حیوانات اونجا اجرا بود این مجلس نیست مجل... مسجد و مسجد عقب مونده ترین قشت جامعه آره یکی از اعضای سابق مجلس که این دفعه رای نگرفت داشت میگفت که خانم سکینه عمرانی میگفت که مجلس اسلامی مثل مسجد برای ما ما اول وضوع میگیریم بعد میریم نماز میخونیم و خب دقیقا هم مشکل هم اینجا هست 
که این مثل مسجد قوانین مذهبی داره تحمیل میکنه روی جامعه و عمیقا عمیقا تا تها همه وجودش ضد زن و ضد بشریه و خب از این خبر میریم به یه خبر نسبتا بهتر و این که در مصر یه لایهی الان داره در مجلس اونجا داره دنبال میشه که خواهان قدغن کردن نقاب در ملع عام و در مراکز دولتی و خب در مصر الان قدغن هست در بعضی جاها مثل برای دکترا و پرستاران و برای در مراکز آموزشی ولی خب این میبره توی سطح خیلی اجتماعی تر وسیع تر و این اشتها برای مبارزه و مقاومت علیه قوانین اسلامی که زنان رو بپوشنن به اشکال مختلف تو کشورهای مختلف وجود داره این کاملا ربط داره به مبارزه بر علیه حجاب اسلامی و به نظر من قدم مثبتی تو خیلی کشورهای اروپایی هم اینطوری هست و واقعا اینو به رسمیت میشناسن که حجاب و نقاب و انواع و اقسام پوشش ها برای زن کاملا یکی از ابزارهای جریانات دستراسی اسلامیه هفته پیش مصاحبه داشتم با نویسنده کینن ملک و با ایشون در رابطه با وضعیت مهاجرت و بحرانی که الان در اروپا و کلا در جهان هست صحبت کردم مصاحبه نسبتا بلندیه ولی به نظرم واقعا نکات خیلی مهمی رو مطرح میکنه امیدوارم خوشتون بیاد نرین جایی با ما باشید و این مصاحبه رو نگاه کنید مرسی Hi, Kina Malik. Welcome Hi. to our program. Well, it's nice to be back. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you first and foremost about this you know, unprecedented migrant crisis that we're facing. What are the root causes of it? Well, the first thing I think is that we call it a migration crisis, but it's as much a crisis of the response as it is about migration. It's the EU's response to migration that has created so many deaths, for instance, that created all the... Um, scenes in the Balkans where, where, where people are piling up in the Balkans that, are, that is creating a, a possible humanitarian crisis in Greece. There was a, a, um, a, a journalist from uh, Der Spiegel magazine, journalist Der Spiegel magazine, who, who visited Frontex, which is the um, European uh, Frontiers Agency uh, responsible for, for um, uh, keeping the borders safe, as it were. And he made the point that the language being used there was that of Europe at war. And I think that's part of the problem, is that we see the, the, the migration crisis as a, as a kind of war between Europe and the migrants. Um, the roots of it are quite deep, in the, in the sense that it, ha it hasn't simply just happened. You know, the people have been die trying to get into Europe for 25 years and more and it can trace the roots of the of, of the current crisis back to the early 1990s and um, at that time Spain had an open border with North Africa and it worked very well um, North African workers used to come to Spain largely to do seasonal work and when there was no work they'd go back and, and there was no problem with it but in 1986 Spain had joined um, the EU and as part of the deal with the EU, Spain had to close its borders. So it created a, a close border with North Africa. It didn't stop migrants coming in, they just took to boats. Um, and it's the first time, in fact, that people started taking to boats to, to, to smuggle themselves in, into Europe. And I think it was May 1991, the first bodies were washed ashore. Um, and since then, there have been something like 20,000 deaths in the, in, 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 in the Mediterranean alone, people of uh, migrants trying to come to Europe. But what the Spanish approach did was that it provided a template for subsequent EU policy towards migrants. Um, there was a uh, EU policy is based on three things, it's a kind of three pronged attack, if you like. The first is to criminalize migrants and treat them as criminals, the second is to militarize border control. So for instance, NATO is now involved in the Aegean in, 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 to, to look for uh, smugglers' boats. And the third thing is to uh, outsource immigration controls, uh, largely to, to countries of North Africa 
or of a place like Turkey. Um, so back in uh, the, the uh, 1990s, um, the EU paid a huge sum of money to Colonel Gaddafi so that his security forces effectively became Europe's border police. Um, now they're paying three billion pound uh, euros to Turkey um, to ensure that Turkey keeps uh, refugees that come from larger from Syria and that they don't enter Europe. So effectively, it's outsourcing uh, border controls and, and, and relocating Europe's borders outside of Europe. And those three approaches, which began with uh, the, the, the Spanish experience, have now become central to uh, the European um, way of dealing, the EU's way of dealing with migration. But some will say, well, no, you know, it's impossible to allow everyone in. What would your response be to that? Well, there, there, there are, there certainly, there, there are much larger numbers coming in um, than there used to be. Um, uh, larger because there's now a, an arc of conflict, if you like, from Afghanistan to Nigeria, caused by the rise of Islamism, of the Islamic State in particular, of Western intervention, a whole host of different reasons where, for why civil authority has collapsed in many of those areas and it has uh, created uh, wars, uh, conflicts, and so there are much larger numbers coming in. But we should not, be, we should not overstate the numbers. A million came last year. Uh, that's about 0 point, or just over 0.1% of the EU's population. In Lebanon, 20% of the population are uh, uh, refugees. Turkey, with which uh, the EU has, has done a deal, so Turkey um, uh, uh, it effectively keeps all the, all, all the Syrian refugees in Turkey. Turkey has over 2 million uh, uh, refugees already. Pakistan has over a million. Iran has over a million. In other words, the poorest, some of the poorest countries in the world already host much, much larger numbers um, than uh, we have in Europe. Uh, if the, the number of refugees in Lebanon, if the same proportion were in Europe, would there be 180 million refugees in Europe? So that, you know, while the numbers are large, we should be wary of, of overstating them. If places, countries like Turkey or um, Pakistan or the Lebanon or Jordan were to take the same, same position, the same stance as the EU does, then we really would have a migrant crisis. Um, and part of the EU's policy, it seems to me, is to try and get the poor, some of the poorest countries in the world to take on the task of, 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 of dealing with the refugee crisis. And that is, Im that is immoral. What do you say to those who say, a majority that are coming are economic migrants, not refugees, and therefore shouldn't be allowed in. I think the distinction between refugees and economic migrants um, is often a false one. If you you might be fleeing from war and conflict and persecution, you might be fleeing from poverty. It's not as if that you can make an easy distinction between the two and say one person should have uh, the, the right to come to Europe, the other person shouldn't. Um, those who fleeing from from um, persecution or from war or conflict are also looking for jobs, are also uh, economic migrants in that sense. So we shouldn't um, overplay that distinction. How about the, you know, people saying that it's fine to have Christians, for example, come to Europe, but given that a large majority of uh, those fleeing are now Muslims, it is going to change the character of Europe and the West? Well, migration always changes the character of, of, of any country, but then so do lots of other things. Um, you know, had not a single migrant come to Europe in the past 50 years, Europe would still be a very different place now than it was 50 years ago. So we imagine that mi it's migration that creates all the changes we see migration does. But there are lots of other things from uh, uh, over the past 50 years um, that created those uh, social changes. So again, we should not overstate uh, the changes that... Um, uh, migration brings about. But there's, a, there's another argument really underlying this, this idea that Christians should come in but Muslims shouldn't. It is that Europe is a Christian continent that has certain values and that Muslims don't hold those values. I think it's a wrong way of looking at how, what values are 
and how societies and communities have values. In any society, in any community, values are contested. There is no society, no uh, uh, community where there is a single set of values. And that's as true of Europe as it is tr uh, as of Muslim communities. Um, a, a supporter of the Front National um, or of Pegida, the, 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 the anti-Muslim group, would have a very different notion of what constitutes European values than, say, you and I would, um, or what should constitute European values than you and I would. Um, similarly, if, if you take Muslim communities, Muslim communities are as diverse um, and as, uh, 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 are as uh, conflicted in, in, in the values they hold as, as any other communities. Why are so many refugees coming to Europe? Because there are conflicts, bitter conflicts, in places like Syria. I.e. there's a contestation of values as the, the kind of country uh, people want Syria to be. Uh, what people call the Arab Spring, the, the uprisings of, of um, uh, people against authoritarian, um, sometimes Islamist leaders um, in the Arab world. That was a contestation of values. Um, and it's worth remembering that in that case, uh, in many countries like Saudi Arabia or Bahrain, um, the rulers were only able to reimpose control because of support from Western governments. So this, this idea, there's this is fundamental distinction between the values of Europe or the values of the West and the values of uh, refugees coming from Muslim majority countries is simply not true. There's a contestation of values. And it seems to me those who argue for allowing Christians in but not uh, Muslims are actually um, very illiberal and therefore very un-European in, 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 uh, in, in the values that they're expressing. What about those who say, well, other refugee waves were different, they were better, you know, this wave is, is, is not the same? It's historical amnesia. They should go back and, and look at how different refugees or groups of migrants were treated. If you go back to the beginning of the last century, when there was a large, um, not a large, just a small influx of Jewish uh, migrants into Europe, Western Europe, fleeing from pogroms in the East, um, there was uproar in uh, in, 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 in um, uh, in, in Western Europe, about Jews coming in. Uh, Britain's first Immigration Act, the 1906 Aliens Act, was designed specifically to keep Jews out of Britain. Uh, people were talking about Jews as undermining British culture, as undermining British values. There was a debate in Parliament um, where one MP um, used quite an extraordinary uh, metaphor. He said, you know, if you have a, a loaf of bread and you have a small grain of arsenic in it, that's fine. But if you have too many grains of arsenic, then you kill yourself. And that's the metaphor he was using for, for, for Jewish refugees coming to Britain. Um, similarly, when Catholics, we forget how um, hated Catholics were, Catholics to, uh, to America, there was a huge uproar about Catholic immigration to America. Um, Catholics were seen actually in much the same way as Muslims are now that their uh, principal loyalty wouldn't be to America, it would be to the Vatican, that they had a set of values distinct from those of American values. And then you had um, the post-war uh, uh, migration from um, the old colonies, European colonies, from uh, South Asia, from the Caribbean, from African countries. And, and the same arguments about uh, being swamped, if you remember Margaret Thatcher's phrase, the, the Britain uh, would not want to be swamped by people of a different culture. Um, this was said in, you know, in the 1970s about um, Asian and Caribbean migrants. So um, the same kinds of arguments that these people are, have different values from us, they have a different culture from us, uh, they won't fit in, they're criminals, uh, they've been made uh, again and again and again with every wave of migration over the past century. What do you say to those who are concerned about security and saying that letting migrants in is letting the jihadis and the Islamists in and that Muslims should be profiled? It's a security risk having them that's different from previous migration waves. Again, 
people used to make the same argument about security risk, actually, in, in, in previous um, uh, waves of migration. But the point is that it may be that within a group of refugees, there are some who are Islamists, maybe there's some who are jihadists. Um, you, you, you may want to weed out the jihadists if you know them to be jihadists. Um, there's no reason why um, uh, you wouldn't want to weed them out, no jihadists. Um, but the point is that, that um, unless you say no one can come into Europe or no one can come into America, the kind of Trump argument, then it'll inevitably be the case that, that, that there may be some who come in who are jihadists. There are certainly some who come in who may be criminals, who may be rapists, uh, who may be uh, reactionary. Um, any random group of people in the world will have people who have reactionary views, who, have, uh, uh, who engage in criminal activities, and so on. Um, refugees are no different. Migrants are no different. Um, they're not saints. Uh, they're like any other random group of people in the world. So unless you say no refugees and no migrants into Europe, you have to accept that that may be the case. Thank you very much. Pleasure. امیدوارم از مصاحبه با کینان ملک خوشتون اومده باشه به نظرم خیلی نکات مهمی رو مطرح میکنه برای من چیزی که اهمیت خیلی بالایی داره اینه که وقتی که ما مواجه هستیم با یه موج میلیونی آدمایی که واقعا دارن برای جونشون جونشون در خطر دارن فرار میکنن واقعا غیر انسانیه ضد بشریه که کمکشو نکنیم مرزا رو باز نکنیم ازشون حمایت نکنیم به خصوص وقتی آمارا رو هم نگاه میکنیم مثلا یه چه یه نصف کل جمعیت سوریه الان مجبور شده فرار کنه یا توی خود سوریه یا خارج از سوریه و نیم میلیون زن سوریه‌ای که فرار کرده نیم میلیونشون حاملن فکر کن تو اون وضعیت الان دمای دم مرزن دارن غرق میشن واقعا خیلی وحشتناک وضعیت و در واقع هر وقت این در ابعاد این فاجعه آدم نگاه میکنه واقعا تاسف انگیزه و از وحشی بودن شرایط دنیای امروز رو در واقع نمایندگی میکنه ولی در این حال اینو من یاد دوران قرون وسطا میندازه که آدم به زمین آدما به زمین بسته بودن فقط توی محیط کوچک میتونستن برن اونجا میواس کار میکردن و اگه از اون محیطش میومدن بیرون به عنوان مجرم شناخته میشدن بی دستگی میشدن و بر برشون میگردنن و الان هم تو همون سین پولی اسکیل و یه فضای بزرگتری به عنوان کشور آدم ها محکومن مهم نیست که جنگ هست مهم نیست که چیز هست سرکوب هست مجبوری تو همون کشور بمونی و ادامه بدی و تحمل بکنی ولی چیزی که همون تو این دوران اون موقع هم این که حق رفت آمد و مهاجرت حق رفتن از اون محل یک حق انسانی به رسمیت شناخته شد امروز هم توی دنیای امروز هم این حق باید به عنوان یک خواست پایه انسانی به رسمیت شناخته باشه حق رفته آمد بدون مرز خارج از مرز و این و یکی از حق... مرز باید باز باشه حق پایه انسانیه و این باید حتما به یکی از خواستای امروز بشر تبدیل بشه شورای علمای اندونزی اعلام کرده که داره فتوا می نویسه هنوز ننوشته ولی اعلام کرده که داره می نویسه مبادا مثلا ما فکر کنیم که کاری نمی کنه همجوری نشسته بیکارن وظایف خودشون رو انجام نمی دن فتوا بدن آره. بزنن تو سر این و اون سرشون خیلی شلوغه باید همه توجه بکنن که اینا منتظر باشن که این زمین لرزه مهم فتوا اینا بیاد بیرون بعد چیزه گفتن که تا به حال یه فتوایی نوشتیم در رابطه با کسایی که هم جنسگران که اینا کسایی هستن که خوب نیستن ضد مذهبن ضد بشری و غیره ولی داریم یکی دیگه می نویسیم در رابطه کسایی که دفاع میکنن از حقوق هم جنسگران اونا هم بعضشون خرابه و ما داریم یه فتوا می نویسیم هر چی با راهای مردم و آزادی مردم ربط داشته باشه اینا نگران هستن و مشغول نوشتن فتوه های مختلف هستن ولی چیزی که مهمه اینه که 
چی اینجا چی مهم چیزی که مهمه اینه که هیچیش مهم نیست <تصفح> بهتر وقتشون رو تلف نکنن وقت ما رو هم تلف نکنن بذارن هر کی میخواد هم جنسگرا باشه هم جنسگرا نباشه فعالیت کنه فعالیت نکنه اصلا به تو چه علمای فت... اندونزی زیپ اون ماشین فتوا رو ببندم فیتلش رو برم پیکارش کنم کار آبرومندانه تر بتا کنم واقعا به یه کار با شرفی یه کاری که خدمت کنیم به جامعه به یه کار درست حسابی بگیرید فکر کنم این هم این, هم این پیشنهاد خیلی خوبی هم هست برای آخونده های ایرانی از همین طور خواهش میکنم هم سریع تر برین یه کار درست حسابی بگیریم مردم رو بل کنین رها کنین لحظه ای از زندگی این هفته عکسی از اعتراضی که آلیا مجال مهدی یک فعال برهنه مصریه که رفت به یه جلسه ای در سوئد که داشتن از هجاب دفاع میکردن و اونجا یک پلاکاردی به دست گرفت که گفت که هجاب زدیت با زنه و علیه نجات پرستی نیست به خاطر اینکه اینجا توی اروپا خیلی اوقات هجاب رو به عنوان سمبل انتخاب زنان مسلمون میبینن واقعیت این که برای اکثریت زنان جهان یه چیزی که تحمیل شده است نمیبینن و خب به همین خاطر این اعتراض آلیا مجرد مهدی واقعا خیلی مهم بودش نخش مهم میبه کنم که این خبر توی ایران کاملا آدم لمس میکنن چون هجاب توی جامعه ایران به وسیله جنت اسلامی و پلیس اسلامی هر روز و شب داره اجبار میشه تو جامعه و این حرکتی رو که آلیا کرد به نظر من همون صحبتی رو بود که ما در ابتدا این برنامه کردیم که گرامی داشت روز جهانی زن گرامی داشت اعتراض و مبارزه شد و این یکی از کارهای خیلی زیبایی که آلیا یک بار دیگه انجام داده زنده باد آلیا دقیقا زنده باد به هر حال رسیدیم به انتهای برنامه من امیدوارم از این برنامه خوشتون اومده باشه خیلی ممنون از همه تماسات تماساتتون تماساتتون تماساتون <تصفح> تماساتون و از طریق فیسبوک یوتیوب از طریق توییتر ایمیل حتما این تماسا رو ادامه بدین کمک های مالی و معنوی تونم واقعا ازتون تشکر, تشکر میکنیم به هر حال تا هفته آینده می‌بینیمتون روزا و شبای خیلی خوبی داشته باشین. بای. Goodbye.